Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of UI Path Forward 2024. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got two guests I'd like to welcome to the show. Terrence G. he is the SVP Technology and Enterprise Transformation and CIO of Coca-Cola Beverages Florida. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And Rob Kennedy, Client Account Director at Capgemini. Thank you both so much. Thanks for having us. So, Coca-Cola is obviously a household name, Terrence, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about Coca-Cola Coke Florida. Sure, so we are a $2 billion company. You have about 5,000 employees. We operate in most of the state, the, the counties rather, in the state of Florida. So we make the Coke products, we move them, we sell them, we service you know, our, our customers uh, throughout the, 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 the state. Um, so we are primarily a B2B you know, company. So if you think about many of the large retailers, we are selling to them and you know, it's our responsibility again to bring those products to life, get them on the shelf and to make sure that the people in the state of Florida have fantastic Coke products to drink. And Rebecca, Republicans and Democrats drink Coke. Uh, they do, they do. <laughs> 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 <That's absolutely laughs> We're in Massachusetts, we, <laughs> our politics is local. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> what are some of the, I mean, it, it sounds like an exceedingly complex organization $2 billion company. Tell us a little about some of the, the most pressing technology challenges that, that you grapple with. Sure, so we are really trying to make sure that we can bring technology, the use of data through all of those major capabilities. So the way that we make the products, right, um, that is a, it is a complicated you know, process, but our ability to draw insights from those processes to be able to bring you know, that process and those capabilities to life in a, in a more uh, streamlined or efficient way, I mean, that's what we're all about. And, and our intent is to be sure that we can pull the thread all the way through. So from the time we make it, our, our uh, movement into the warehouse, getting it on the store shelf, uh, merchandising those products, and then helping our uh, sales folks be more efficient. So one of the things that we do spend time on is really trying to understand what are the big value drivers? I mean, what is it that we need to do to make money? And my job is to be sure that we apply technology in the most appropriate ways, but focused on the things that really do create the most value. And not too surprising, AI, automation, those are two of the things that we're spending quite a bit of time focusing on and bringing them to bear in those key parts of our business. So the industry has an interesting track record, I'll say, of you know, shiny new toys come out, technology vendors, a lot of hype, um, make a lot of promises, gets deployed. You know, the early pioneers take the arrows. What do you do? You call the GSI, help me actually make this stuff work, because it's all about the value. And you're willing to pay for that value, no question Absolutely. about it. But I feel like we've built up you know, a lot of infrastructure and sort of heavy lifting to get where we are today, and now there's a new promise coming out. Gen AI is going to make everything simple. Okay, we're two years in, we know that's not the case. <laughs> and so, so, how do you step back and strategize from you know, internal Coke perspective, Coke Florida, and working with partners to say, okay, we have a lot of experience. Some of us have gray hairs, right? <laughs> um, but let's not make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. Let's sure. put together a plan and you know, we know what we know, there's some things that we might not know, but so how do you, from a CIO perspective, how do you do that and, and, and where does your partner fit in? Yeah, so if you think about it, one of the things that is really most important is learning lessons from the past. Mm -hmm. So if you go all the way back to you know, Henry Ford and automation and standardization, you know, one thing that's always been true is that you know, even as the technology became uh, readily available, advanced, you can't get away from those pesky people, right? <laughs> so one of the taglines in the conference today automation is going to be agentic and robotic. And that's true, but getting good business results, well, that is decidedly human, and I think it will be so for quite some time. And so part of what we're really trying to do is to make sure that we understand, you know, the technology in some ways has become the easy part, but how is it that you make sure that you've got a workforce that is going to adopt what you're rolling out, what you're deploying, which means you've got to get them to believe that it is the right thing to do, that is going to impact them in a, in a positive way. So there's this whole messy business of adoptions, 
adoption is one part of it, but then you also have to be sure that you're engaging from leaders to managers to frontline you know, folks, and then ultimately enabling them and putting them in a position to be successful. So our strategy, which at the end of the day is just about making choices, a good bit of the choices to double down on understanding how this unfolds in a way that truly does bring our people along the ride, along the, the way, you know, with us and not make the mistake that the technology is a panacea. And if I get that right, then everything is going to be great because we know that that's just not the case. Rob, this is a great point that Terrence yeah. is making. And you can have a wonderful business case, but if a third of the people that you think are going to adopt it, or they just give it lip service, you know, they don't lean in, then you get no business case. So how do you Absolutely. address this from your perspective? And what patterns are you seeing and how do you apply success rules, you know, to customers like Coke Florida? Yeah, I, I think, you know, from a, a, a vendor perspective, like we are, it's all about the relationship building that we do very quickly, right? When we came into Coke Florida early, uh, and we had a mission to deploy the automation, but very quickly it turned from, you know, a cost savings effort to a real value realization effort. And I think the big difference was we learned the co-Florida culture, right? And we learned the people, we understand how they worked, and we were able to adopt that in our own team and be able to, uh, uh, you know, kind of show that same kind of Coke Florida uh, connectivity that they have in the, in, in the office there with our own Capgemini people. So we just blend right in and now we feel like we are one team. Uh, and I think that made a big difference because like you know, Terrence said, it, it's really all about the people. Without, without the people connection, you're really not gonna get the true value realization that you're looking for. And, and I think it was really all about us just learning that culture, getting ourselves imbued in there. And now, you know, we feel like we're all one, one, big, one big team. So walk us through that process, because that, that is really fascinating. First, you need to make sure that you are acclimatizing to the culture, part of the culture, you're, you're one mission driven. But then what are some other best practices that have emerged in terms of making sure that people, as Terrence was saying, are on board, they're adopting, and they're seeing a positive benefit from, from, the, from the bottom up and the, and the top down? Yeah, it, you know, it's all about building a cohesive communication plan both within the company and without, right? To make sure that there's a way to communicate the change that's coming, make sure that's in a positive light, make sure that people understand things like automation are not something to be feared, it's actually something to look forward to because it's gonna actually augment what you're doing is gonna help you do your job better. Uh, and so building that communication, the communication plan is really important. Uh, and then also having a really good strategy and understanding where they wanna be, not a year, but in two years, three years, five years, so that we can also start to merge the team and make sure they're going down the right path. Yes. I'll give you two other things that are important. So one is um, transparency. So you have to be really, really clear on what is it that you're trying to do here? Um, we talk a lot about value, but that becomes an overused term and people will interpret that a number of different ways. So we've been very clear that for us to be able to get value, there are really three different ways of looking at it. One of them is individual productivity. And so we've spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure that people can see that there's something in it for them so that they really do feel like, hey, my day unfolds better yep. because of the changes that you've been able to put in place. The other is more team efficiency or effectiveness. So not just the individual members, but, but, but this, this team that I sit on. So one area in particular is around planning. I mean, if we can plan the work the right way, our ability to execute it is going to be so much better. So, so we spent time really trying to make sure that everybody understands that is part of the work that we're trying to do is to make sure that people understand that there's not only individual productivity, team efficiency and effectiveness, but then also true enterprise value. So it might be hard for each of those individuals to understand, like, how is this better for me? But they do understand that we've taken the time to, to define and be real clear and transparent about how do we make money in this business? And these are the areas that if we spend time focused on them and we can use the new technology to bring that to life in a more effective way, then we all benefit. So it's the individual productivity, the team efficiency and effectiveness, and then the enterprise value. So, so far as just the transparency, but the other thing is, is fluency. So the other thing that becomes real clear is that we oftentimes say the same words, but mean something very different. So there's a certain clarity that comes along with that, but my ability to not just be literate, but to be truly fluent in these things, right? artificial intelligence, automation, and how they fit together. 
that's when we get to the point where we can really sort of co-create and co-collaborate, you know, on solutions with the folks in our organization and not just have it feel like, hey, this is the, the, the next thing that the technology guys said we've got to adopt versus, listen, I understand enough about what's possible and I'm the one that does this all day, every day. So do you think we might be able to do X? Their ability to do that is, is enhanced tremendously when they've got a fluency about the kind of work that we do and the kinds of things that the tools can enable. So this transparency and influency become two critical parts of the overall system. And it's really empowering for the for the for the workers. Absolutely, because again, it feels like and not just feels like, but they are part of the solution making versus, you know, us coming in and saying, Have I got something great for you? You know, you, you know you ought to have some fear and trepidation when anybody <laughs> tells you that. So a $2 billion company with 5,000 employees is, is big enough such that 100% of the, the people, the team members, aren't going to agree on what enterprise value is. <laughs> Absolutely. So how do you adjudicate that? Is it a top, is it a, is it a C-suite partnership? And then you develop a, a communications plan and you know kind of get the data, debate, align, and execute. How, how do you handle that as a, as a CIO? It's a little bit of top down and bottom up. So I not only have the CIO's title, but I also am responsible for enterprise transformation. And that is truly rooted in understanding. Again, I hate to overuse this, but it is true. What drives value in our business? And so we've done, I think over the course of, we're about nine and a half years old, we'll be 10 years old here shortly. And we've been pretty consistent in telling people, these are the things that we have to focus on in order for us to drive value, in order for us to be able to have the impact in the communities that you all live, work, and play in. And we've been consistent. And you can go and you can look at things that we talked about back in 2015, and the detail might change. The so content, but the context is largely the same. So part of it, I think, really is being consistent in that message to where, you know, you, you get the impression these guys really do believe this, and we do. And so that message really is around what creates value. So I would argue that maybe not 5,000, but many of those employees, they could tell you, I know what our big enterprise transformation programs are, and I understand where I fit into them. Is that a day one thing? Absolutely not. But over time, I think we've been able to put that message um, out consistently in a way that when people see our actions, they understand that they actually line up with some um, strategic choices that have been made. And those choices are clearly rooted in our belief about what drives our business and how do we drive that business in a way that it really does connect with the things that the Coca-Cola company is trying to do as well. But ultimately, as a family-owned, independent business, you know, we've got to be clear about what creates value for us, and that's what we've done. So, Rob, it's not uncommon that CIOs are also responsible for enter enterprise transformation because the, he or she has the purview of the entire organization. But right. is it, well, have you seen any patterns? Is it becoming more common? For two-part question. And, you know, what role is automation playing in that transformation? It must be a, a key cog in the, in the wheel. It is, and we definitely see a lot of CIOs taking on that additional responsibility of the transformation part. It's, it's definitely starting to work, especially since there's such a reliance on the technology to really get folks where they want to be. I think that's a good place for it to, to live, right, with the, with the CIO. Um, what we are seeing is yeah, with all of the new generative AI products that are coming out there and you know, uh, agentic AI and things like that, that even just has to double down on the relationship part, right? Uh, understanding the client, understanding their culture, and making sure that those plans that we have uh, work because uh, we're, we're going through another wave. We had, a, we had a wave five or six years ago where you know RPA was really taken off and people were a little concerned and some, some of the businesses were, uh, some of the folks that were inside the business that feel like they're going to be impacted uh, and we had to do a lot of work to make sure that they felt comfortable with it. I think we're, we're coming to another inflection point now where we're going to have to do all that again because they're also going to see uh, now, hopefully they see the benefits of what we've done over the last five years at Coke Florida. And so in this particular case, I think we're much better positioned to make them feel better about what's coming in the, in the future. IT spending during the pandemic, it reminded me of Y2K. It was almost like open checkbook just to keep you know, the businesses going. In fact, exiting COVID when we were still in zero interest rate environments, 
CIOs were expecting about 7 to 8% IT spend growth at the macro, which is really robust. And then as interest rates started to pop up, that dropped down to below 3%. And it's, today it's in the mid threes, and 45% of the, the customer accounts tell us in our large surveys that they're stealing from other budgets to fund their gen AI. Um, and, and it suggests to us that, and, and they're complaining about the ROI, we hear that in the news all the time. So it's not self-funding yet, Terrence. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel where Gen AI generally, or specifically in, in AI, you know, generally in automation is throwing off enough cash that you can have gain sharing such that it, it'll be self-funding. I, I do, I do see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but one of the ways that we've tried to make sure that we can you know, see that light sooner is to not get too lathered up about Gen AI in particular. I mean, the reality is old fashioned, you know, predictive AI, machine learning. I mean, that's been a workhorse for a whole bunch of business for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the way in which, you know, we try to manage just a complex supply chain, being able to apply artificial intelligence. So again, machine learning, so not generative AI, but just, I'll call it again, the, the basic blocking and tackling, we have been able to see benefit in that regard. And so I look at the continuum Right, I don't get too high, go, don't get too low, don't spend too much time getting people, again, sort of lathered up over generative AI, but it's the spectrum. Yes, I can use artificial intelligence to do everything from predict, mimic, and create, but if you take that entire spectrum and say, how does that basket produce results for our business? It's a pretty impressive basket. And there, so that's the approach. Yeah. It's interesting, there's still some customers that tell us, well, yeah, we're not really leaning into Gen AI yet. Now it's a much smaller percentage than it was, say, a year ago, but there was an article in the Wall Street Journal this week uh, about Tim Cook saying, we don't want to be first, we always want to be the best. So we'll let others kind of, you know, be the icebreakers, maybe yeah. make mistakes, and then we'll figure it out from there and come up with the best implementation. A lot of people, you know, in the media would say, no, no, that's a big mistake. You know, you got to lean in. You're in big trouble if you miss out. But, you're, you're nodding, but, Rob. But, but maybe a more sort of a measured approach is the right one. Yes. I, I think the, a measured approach might be a right one, but there's also, you have to have the confidence and the guts to, 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 to really get in, right? There, there's, there's, a, there's a point where we're at right now where I think that if you don't start really thinking about your AI journey, what that looks like in the next two to five years, you're going to find yourself a little bit behind. And so we have a lot of clients that are that are that they're nervous about making the investments or nervous about what it means to them or you know those things and, and we have to help them kind of get over those fears because this is going to move very very fast right in the next in the next couple of years things are going to turn on a dime and we are trying to get those folks that feel still a little hesitant to kind of jump in and really say hey we got to take this seriously we uh, it needs to be in the plan and, uh, and we need to work with somebody that's going to help us navigate. And I would waters. agree with that, but I would say don't freak out about LLMs. Do some experimentation. Start with your data. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and understand that. How are you going to harmonize that? How are you going to govern that? You know, what about PII? Understand the regulations and these other guardrails. That, to me, is how you start to get your AI house in order. The, the, data is, the, the data is an important part, right? Because we work with a lot of clients that we can't really get the generative AI to do what they want to do because the data sets that they're trying to use, they need a lot of work. And so there's a, there's a big investment. But again, if you don't start now thinking about that in that two to five year roadmap and thinking about, well, I got a year of data cleansing that I'm going to have to do and data consolidation before an AI model can really unlock the power of that data, you got to start thinking about that now. Thoughts on that? But think about data, let's think about operating model, you know, versus projects, because you're right. You could burn through a lot of cash just executing projects that may or may not have the right results. But if you believe, and I do believe, that there will be light at the end of the tunnel, you will be able to see how across that broad spectrum of artificial intelligence, uh, benefits and value are created then I think you have to look at those two things. So the data, as you described, just so not to repeat that, but operating model as well. Because if you believe, and I do, that artificial intelligence, some of these breakthroughs are going to allow for business model innovation, then you have to have the right operating model to be able to say, 
you know, if business model is how I make money, the operating model is how I bring that to life, and I've got to figure out how to build the right capabilities in between. And so if you invest time now in trying to put that together, like I said, I, I think the tools have largely caught up with, or they will catch up with our collective aspirations. But if that happens and you're not actually ready from an operating model standpoint, then you're not gonna get the business model innovation or it won't be sustainable. And so that's really where we put a lot of our time and effort. And again, I, I talk about you know thinking about artificial intelligence as this continuum. I mean, some of what we've talked about here, again, the machine learning, I mean, those are pretty tried and true you know, things. And so, but, but they have helped condition us, right, to the work required to be sure that there is integrity in the data, that you can think about not just security, but privacy, that you can think about the ethics. And so those are some of the things that we've had to increase the capabilities, you're right, because we can see the changes in the operating model that are being driven by these new aspirations that we have for our business model. Great point about the operating model. We learned that with cloud, you lifting and shifting didn't really do much for us, but if you were able to change the operating model, you could put you know, hundreds or of millions or millions in your bottom line. So. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Terrence and Rob, thank you both so much for coming on. A really great conversation. Great stuff, you guys. I appreciate it. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.